Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. Dr. Eugene Lipov is a board-certified physician in anesthesiology and pain management. He has been practicing in the field of pain medicine since 1990. Dr. Lipov completed Northwestern Medical School in 1984, anesthesia residency at the University of Illinois in 1989, and advanced pain training in 1990. Dr. Lipov pioneered the adaptation of a well-known procedure called stellate ganglion block, SGB, for treating trauma-related symptoms. Dr. Lipov has treated over 200 veterans, including those through Healing Hero, as well as treated several hundred civilian patients with the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder from all over the world. Dr. Lipov has treated military-related post-traumatic stress disorder, military sexual trauma, PTSD due to first responder trauma, and non-military sexual trauma, pediatric sexual trauma, and post-traumatic stress disorder from other traumatic events. Well, Dr. Lipov, welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. It's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you for having me. It's been a while. I... uh, I usually like to start off asking people, you know, how did you get into this particular area of interest? What's, uh, what's the journey that brought you into uh, pain management? Pain management or PTSD-related pain management? Yeah, all of it. The, the Both? Stuff that's, it's your passion today. Yeah. Um, so I was, both of my parents are physicians, and I was actually training to become a surgeon. And then my mother killed herself in the first three weeks or first three months of my internship. So I really had some issues following that. My father was depressed. It was a very hard time for me. So I left surgery and I went to, I started doing anesthesia training. So in anesthesia training, there's a few different fields in anesthesia. One of them is pain medicine. What I liked about that is Getting rid of pain, I think, is meaningful. It takes a lot of skill sets that I think I was able to acquire. And um, I also had a propeller blade injury, so I understand something about nerve pain from my personal experience. And then as I was doing pain medicine, um, my brother and I came up with the idea of treating hot flashes using one of the anesthetics techniques that we use called stellar ganglion block. So we did that and it worked really well, but the main problem has been people said, we're not gonna really accept it until you figure out why it works. So I started trying to figure out why it works. During that, I read about 3000 articles about sympathetic block or stellar ganglion block, things like that. One of the articles was from Finland where the surgeons actually did T2 clipping, which is basically putting uh, instrument in the chest and clipping some ganglia in there and for hand sweats. But they found out it took away PTSD. And then I went back and I looked at the anatomy. It turns out this ganglia is connected to the neck ganglia and that's why I proceeded to do an injection for PTSD. So the reason I'm very interested in PTSD is a couple of fold. One, my father had PTSD from World War II and living with him was interesting put it mildly. Also having seen my personal trauma with my mother's death and the way she died was very traumatic for me. So I was very interested for personal reasons. Eventually it led me having a stellar ganglion block done for me by my chairman. Um, and then mental health is a very big interest for me and especially effective therapeutics, especially because of my mother. And she was under the care of psychiatrists when she died. And if you look at conventional therapies, a lot of times they're not that effective or they're slow to act. I prefer it to be effective and fast to act. Wow, that's a powerful story. I'd heard about the, uh, 
the injury with the uh, motorboat blade, but I hadn't heard about your mother. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah. So many of us are motivated by our personal stories in this work. And one of the things I really like about what you're doing, uh, especially with veterans, you and I first met at, at a panel for veterans and PTSD, is that so many people are getting treated with psychotropic medications for post-traumatic stress disorder with little or no good results and often negative effects. And then it's a long-term pattern. Um, can you speak a little about what, what you've learned about using psychotropics for post-traumatic stress and how it, it isn't as good as what you're proposing? Well, I, <laughs> yes, I could definitely talk to that. Uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, first of all, I'm an anesthesiologist. Um, however, my review of the information available, there was a really interesting article written in JAMA, Journal of Medical, Journal of American Medical Association, by Dr. Hogue, H-O-G-E, who is a psychiatrist from Walter Reed, from, 19, uh, from 2011. And he basically said that current therapeutic, which is psychotherapy and pharmaceuticals, efficacy rate is about 40%. Uh, and the reason he said that is because he believes there is a very low compliance, so people don't want to take medications because they're not very effective, and it takes a long time. But specifically, as far as medications, one of the most common drugs used by the VA right now is Reservatol and Seroquel, atypical on psychotics, major tranquilizers. There was a study done by Dr. Crystal from Yale, and he basically did a large study on, I believe, 11 VAs, and they found it was ineffective. But the other part was those drugs is they can cause obesity, diabetes, one out of a thousand people per year use, the heart stops and they can die from that. And a lot of times it seems to lead to anger issues. So many patients I've met actually take those medications and they throw them down the toilet because they don't want to take it. Um, the other thing is there was studies showing that if you're not consistent with atypical antipsychotics, the chance of suicide rate increases by a factor of three. So I would say that whole class of compounds for PTSD is very problematic. Um, the other drugs which are used for PTSD commonly is SSRIs, and the efficacy is quite soft, shall we say. Um, the problem is a lot of times people have cocktails, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, highly addictive drugs, and that's very hard to get people off of that. Also can affect memory and other functions. Well, and that's one of the reasons that so many of us in the field are always looking for a feasible experiential or non-psychotropic way to help people with their trauma. Um, I recently was introduced to the book Healing Depression Without Medication by Jody Skillicorn. It's a brand new book this year, but she talks about having read Robert Whitaker's book on the anatomy of an epidemic and learning about how as a psychiatrist, she was trained to give all kinds of medications which not only are not very effective, but often have negative side effects. And um, so she's written this book about the various tools and techniques she's using, things that psychotherapists and psychologists are using to do experiential work to help people re-experience and, and heal. And one of the things about that is it works with a certain number of people and it's a lot of work and what you're offering is a procedure that doesn't put people on medication day after day week after week for and and many of them are told many of the people that come to me have been told by their doctor they need to be on these medications for the rest of their lives and what you're suggesting is a procedure that's got a beginning and an end it's very quick can you tell us a little bit about your procedure yeah of course by the way, that book, uh, Not Even the Epidemic, is an amazing book. I, I read that book. That, that's that's mind-altering. Mind uh, so the procedure we are talking about is 
I'm an anesthesiologist, as I said, I'm not a psychiatrist. So the whole concept behind this procedure is that people with PTSD have a sympathetic system, which is fight and flight system, which is overactive. So in pain medicine, uh, the first time something called stellate ganglion block, which is an injection in the neck, was done in 1925 for hand sweating or burning or headaches. So it's been done for close to a century now. And basically the idea is to manipulate the sympathetic or fight or flight system. Yeah, so the way the procedure works is we are blocking or rebooting a sympathetic system to the pre-trauma state. So we do an injection in the neck that seems to reboot it. And a lot of times it can work in 10, 15 minutes. So the effect is very fast. Also, it can last for months or years. What's interesting is when people come in and they say, I had this trauma and I had this happen to me, um, I tell them, I really don't need to know what happened to you. You don't have to give me any information. And it's very hard for people to recite all the trauma and everything they've gone through. They seem to like very much that this is relatively straightforward. All they need to do is be able to lie on the table, you place the needle in the neck under guidance, you put the medication in, and three to five minutes, they're done. And then how long before you know whether it's had the desired effects? A lot of times it's immediate, meaning within 20 minutes. Uh, if it doesn't give enough relief, then we take the patient back to the operating room and we do a C3 injection, which is another sympathetic block higher up. When we do it like that, the success rate seems to improve from 70s to 80s or higher. Now, when you say you take them back, are you talking about within the same day, within the same period of time? Within 20, 30 minutes. Oh, okay. Because what it does, if you do it at C6 level and then higher up level, it seems to have a more of a reboot of the system. And then is there a need for reapplication? What What are the the rates of people who might need it again you said it works sometimes for hours or, or months or so the longest outlier we have now is 13 years ago he had two injections uh, some people need a few of them together uh, it also depends on the biology of the person it also depends on amount of stress for example we we treated a young lady who was uh, molested by her uncle at six years old we treated her at 12 she was doing good for a year and then somebody tried to abduct her at a shopping mall, and then we had to retreat her after that. So it depends on the amount of stress or trauma that happens later. Average number of procedures we do per person is about two and a half. Over what period of time? That's an average number. So the first one typically lasts a few months to a year, and the next one can last years. Do you have some other... Uh, examples of people who benefited from it who weren't responding to other medications or treatments? Yeah, we, have, we have a number. We've treated various cohorts. We've treated a uh, number of veterans. So I'll give you an example of the 13-year the gentleman. So he was uh, special ops from Peoria, Illinois. His name is Jason Brown. There's a number of videos about him on uh, YouTube. And then he was brought down twice when the helicopter was shut down. And then following that, uh, he was patrolling the street in Iraq and a 10 year old child was sent at him to take out his squad, which was laden with explosives. He shot the child, uh, the piece of the child hit him. He had severe PTSD. He came home and um, he tried to strangle his wife a few times in his, her sleep. And then we treated him and then 13 years ago, and again, he's doing great now. He's still married to the same woman, and he's functional. And he's unknown meds as far as I know. Wonderful. I, I ran into someone who had been a Vietnam era vet and had um, a fairly typical pattern of whenever there was a helicopter going over or the 4th of July came, he was just all but a basket case. He was not able to function normally when those kinds of noises would, would come at him. 
And he had, um, I'm not sure if he went through your clinic. I met him up here out in the uh, McHenry County, Illinois area. And, was that Raleigh uh, Shawans by any sense? It might have been. Big guy? Uh, Big guy? I'm, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not all that comfortable talking about their names as you seem to be. I, I have well, this the, kind of... Well, the reason I, I feel comfortable talking about him because he was on Fox News with me. So he's been out there on the media. That's all, that's the only reason I can talk about names. Good. Let us know a little bit about that because I met him and he, he raved about the procedure. That's probably Raleigh. So Raleigh and I met, he was unfortunately suicidal at the time. And then um, he had 40 years of psychotherapy, 4-0, all the psychotropics, nothing worked. We treated him, uh, I think, in 2007. Oh, I'm sorry, 2009. And I think he's still doing great. He had two stellates. Yeah, it was, uh, he, he had a high praise for that process. And I, I wasn't sure that it was you who had done it with him, but um, he'd been very active for veterans. And um, that's and right. Have... No, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and I, I know that uh, I had been doing as much work as I could to promote that I would use some of these non-invasive tactics, not your procedure, but therapy procedures, mind, body, energy work with um, veterans and do it, you know, for very reduced fee or free. And that's how I ended up with him. The Veterans Administration up here in um, McHenry County um, was sending people to me and, and we had a connection through that. So if it works with something that's that long lasting, someone who was in the Vietnam War 30 some, 40 some years ago, um, that's very impressive. That Because as you mentioned, there are all kinds of people who've done practically every therapy they could come across and every medication that's in the list with no good lasting results. Sometimes people get temporary results, but most of those psychotropic medications for that kind of issue. As you mentioned, if there's another traumatizing, traumatizing event, it just kind of resets the system. And so it's, it's really good to have an option like what you present. Thank you. Is there a way you can tell us how people find out about you? What's, what's the, the best way for people to reach out, learn more about your stellate gangling block and I think if you go to www.stellacenter.com, you can get all the information. And also, if you'd like to have the procedure done, you can fill out the forms and things like that. I also have a non-for-profit organization I belong to. It's called erasedptsdnow.org. So if people feel obliged or they would like to donate something to us, no donation too small, no donation too big. Uh, we treat a lot of errands at no cost, which we love doing. And funders as well. And and what? First responders. All right, excellent. So, do, do you do you fire. reach out? Do you reach out to those first responders in a specific way? Are you doing marketing to them? How do people find out about you? Uh, we work with some psychologists who work with them. Uh, we really haven't done a huge amount of marketing. We're about to start doing some. And where are you based? Where do you do this work? Um, downtown Chicago and Oak Brook. So in, in the Oak Brook area and in downtown Chicago, you have two different places where people can receive this treatment? Yes, sir. They're both ASCs, which is surgical centers. Well, so is there another category of person besides somebody who's had uh, an identifiable physical trauma or assault that might respond well to this technique if they've got symptoms related to hypervigilance or anxiety or? Well, it seems to work on people with basically sympathetic overreactivity, which is as you basically mentioned them. So nightmares, overreactivity stimuli, things like that. So it could be, we've taken care of some patients who had reactive attachment disorder. Not a huge number of those, but we've done some of them. They seem to have worked with that. Um, 
obviously military people, you know, various cohorts. We've taken care of people who were abused by clergy. That was identified trauma. Um, not everybody has truly identified trauma, but it, my focus is on symptoms, right? So oversensitivity of sympathetic system, that's what we're trying to work on. And in one of our conversations, you mentioned being able to scan to find out if a candidate was a good, if a person was a good candidate for this. Uh, and, and you also talk about how often when people say, you know, there's nothing identifiable, you have a hunch that we just haven't figured out that scan yet, that there will be something going on within the person that our advancing scanning technology will reveal to us. Yeah, so I, I think it's more than that. I think this, so basically people talk about invisible wounds of the war or period invisible wounds. So my contention that, is that they're invisible if you have the wrong scanner. There is at least two scanners, maybe three scanners, which are available, which will tell you when somebody has PTSD with a high rate of certainty. So the brain scans such as functional MRI, Dr. Librazan described that in 1980, I believe, that amygdala, which is part of the brain that controls fear and anxiety, is overactive in PTSD patients. With today's scanning technique of neurosciences, you can be about 90% sure who has PTSD and who does not. So I think it exists. It's not a matter of not existing. It does exist. Wonderful. And so when people come to you, if they want to be evaluated for it, do you require those kinds of scans? No, they're not available clinically. This is a research tools right now. Okay. We, we use PCL which is PTSD checklist. It's a standard way to assess people's symptoms of PTSD and also how well they do after the procedures. Okay. And what's the, the, the age range for people? I think you mentioned someone who was six. Did you treat that person when she was six? No, she was molested at six. Um, I try not to treat children under 12. And usually there is no absolute top limit of age. It depends how healthy those people are. The oldest person I think I treated with PTSD was 88, but I did a bunch of scans, make sure the carotid was okay, the heart was okay, everything else was okay. And then and what's the, the young end that you normally work with? My usual cutoff age is 12 years old. Do you get a lot of people that young with PTSD that are coming to you for treatment? Not a lot, but I have a particular uh, interest in those children because my son had some issues, but I certainly have done some very young people at that age. If you think about, you know, sexual molestation, especially in girls, is very common, unfortunately, or quite common at very young age, and how they're behaving is a big problem. It's very hard population to treat in general. And yet, with this work, you're getting good results as young as. 12, but certainly older. Yes, because, I, again, the great thing here is compliance is very high. Uh, and then keep in mind, I have done Stella Gingdon blocks on two three-year-olds when I did academic work for arm pain. So doing an injection on somebody that young is not that weird. It's just the indication is different. All right. So what else do you want us to know about this fabulous option people have for resolving the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder? What, what is there about your work we haven't even asked you about yet? Hmm, I don't know. I think the future of trauma, I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, I'm very proud to say that I am a chief medical officer for an organization called Stella Center and high quality outfit that plan between I and them is to develop, having this available any place in the United States and internationally as we roll this out. And then the other part, I'm hoping that people understand that PTSD is a biological phenomena that's diagnosable and treatable using, using biological methodology and rapidly. I think that's the key. High compliance, high efficacy rate is what people are looking for. 
And as a, you know, if I remember correctly, you're a board certified anesthesiologist. So. I'm board certified and board certified in pain medicine, which is a separate board. And there, well, I just want to point this out to people because a lot of times when a relatively new procedure or technique comes along, uh, that's one of the biggest questions I get from people. Well, you know, is this, is this safe? Does this person know what they're doing? And you've certainly been at this a long time and it's gotten excellent results. And uh, I've been hearing about you and this work for uh, at least 10 years now, probably more. Uh, since yeah, I think testimony in front of the U.S. Congress from uh, 2010. I have a letter of support from uh, Senator Obama from 2007. I've been working at this a long time. You're right, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just an, a pleasure to see you again. Thanks for talking with us and making this information available. I want to remind uh, the people listening that um, if you're watching this um, on the video, we will have all of the information about how to reach uh, Dr. Lipov, and uh, it'll be in the blog post. But it's S T E L L A Center C E N T E R dot com is the website and um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today it's a pleasure to see you again sir thanks for having me on you've been listening to the on your mind podcast offered by journey's dream where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being if you love our show we invite you to visit on your mind podcast.org to join the conversation access the show notes and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.